Good evening, peoples, and uh, welcome back to our living room with me and Ginger Snap here for the uh, final part of our seven-part series on the seven deadly sins. There are seven of them, so of course it's a seven-part series, despite there only being six Tuesdays in Lent. Uh, so if you missed uh, last night's uh, look into Vainglory, it should still be on Facebook if you scroll down a couple inches. Uh, pff, once I blow the cat fur directly out of my face because cat. Uh, so of course, seven deadly um, by, uh, sins that we've been looking at are um, avarice, envy, gluttony, lust, sloth, vainglory, and wrath. Um, and pride is generally understood to be the root of all seven. Uh, so because, as I've said before, words change over time, I definitely want to start off with some vocab here because I think it's very important to differentiate two very different things here. So when we're talking about wrath, uh, we are referring, as uh, dictionary.com uh, defines it, uh, a strong, stern, or fierce anger, deeply resentful indignation, ire. Uh, ire is very appropriate because the Latin word here is ira, so ire or irate uh, comes very directly from, from that. Um, so wrath can also be vengeance or punishment as the consequence of anger. Uh, writer Dorothy Sayers um, was a little bit more poetic, saying that the love of justice perverted to revenge and spite is wrath. So it's like you're trying to make up for something, but like going way overboard. You know, thought that was a neat way of looking at it. So this is very much in contrast to anger, which is a strong feeling of displeasure and belligerence aroused by a wrong. So uh, wrath is uh, more indignant and resentful and wanting vengeance, and anger is the result of a wrong. So very, very, very different things. Uh, so part of this is inspired by uh, Glittering Vices by Rebecca Conan Dyke de Young, and she actually entitles her chapter on this um, Anger, uh, Holy Passion, or Hellish Emotion. And um, I mean, I'm sure she's way smarter than me and has studied these things a lot more, but uh, I personally would not have translated Ida as anger rather than wrath, um, even though, yet again, wrath is not a word that gets used in everyday sentences, at least not for me, maybe for Ginger Snap, who is apparently kneading bread. Who knew? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ginger Snap. So, uh, St. Aquinas uh, felt that if anger was justified, it was not a sin. Uh, for example, he that is angry without cause shall be in danger, but he that is angry with cause shall not be in danger. For without anger, teaching will be useless, judgments unstable, crimes unchecked. Therefore, to be angry is not always an evil. So what is the difference between justified anger and sinful wrath? Because these are two very different things. And um, yeah, anger is often justified. Jesus definitely got a pretty darn ticked off at some people in the temple. Uh, if you're ever asking yourself, what would Jesus do? Never forget that an option is to turn over tables and throw things around in public. Just saying. That is, I mean, that's usually not the best solution to the vast majority of problems in the world, but I'm just saying, Jesus got angry, and th the answer to what would Jesus do, sometimes it's a very uh, table turny. Uh, so, Rebecca writes, good anger fights for a good cause, which I thought was a, a very good and, and short summation, that good anger fights for a good cause. So how could good anger be manifested? Uh, there's certainly um, the image of calls for social justice. Um, she has a, a great um, illustration of imagine Martin Luther King Jr. preaching about social injustice, but calmly. That would be that would be weird and unsettling. Um, that, uh, that would be disturbing. Like I mean, social injustice should make you angry. Um, that's how change happens. Um, so anger uh, can be the drive for change and improvement. Um, if you're really angry at the pothole just outside your, uh, your driveway, um, you know, that, that anger might um, make something actually happen because of it. Um, and anger if you're um, feeling solidarity with people who are hurting, that is also definitely good anger. 
Uh, so she also says, anger, when it is a holy emotion, has justice as its object and love at its root. So anger um, is upset at an injustice and it's trying to find a solution or force a solution into happening by sheer force of will. Um, but it is, the object is justice, not revenge. And the reason you're angry is because you care about someone or, or something that is being done wrong. So, uh, could there be times when it would be a sin to condemn anger? Uh, this, this seems a little bit counterintuitive at first uh, because, I mean, anger is, um, can often be a problem. It can often be manifested uh, not, not very kindly, uh, for, for sure. Um, so, but uh, I think it's a lot easier to say, stop being angry or calm down. Never tell someone to calm down. Telling someone to calm down has literally never made anybody calm down. It's just going to tick them off even more. Why does anyone ever say calm down? Anyway, um, but it's also easier to say, uh, let it go, or it's in the past, or Hakuna Matata, I guess. Um, is, is that more relatable than, than last night's superhero rant, I hope? We've all seen Lion King, right? If we haven't, that needs to be fixed. Y'all can borrow my DVD. Uh, great movie. It's good cat role models for, for cats. Um, where was I? Uh, man, I miss, ha miss having um, actual humans in the room to, to keep me in check. Um, yeah, so it's a lot easier um, to uh, say stop being angry or forget that it happened or move on, um, but it's a lot harder to address a root issue that is causing justified anger. We talk a lot in the church about forgiveness, which don't get me wrong, forgiveness is very good and very important, and forgiveness is definitely something that we should try to do and achieve on a daily basis. Um, if we pray uh, to God, forgive us our sins as we forgive uh, those who hurt us, I mean, we, we should be forgiving people. I, I don't wanna, uh, um, you know, say otherwise. But we don't say as much in the church about stop hurting people or identify your sins and find ways to stop hurting people. Uh, we don't really talk, at least in um, Presbyterian churches, about uh, contrition and uh, really facing your deepest, darkest, whatever, um, because that's really uncomfortable. But um, a lot of forgiveness language can be very difficult. I mean, if someone has really hurt you. Um, we can often paint forgiveness as forget that it happened or just move on or um, repairing a relationship, but forgiveness to someone who has really hurt you can absolutely mean cutting them out of your life. Um, if you don't wish them ill, um, but you recognize that they're not going to change, that can be forgiveness. Um, you, you don't have to pretend something didn't happen and say that it's forgiveness. That's, that's not forgiveness. That's, that's, that's not what forgiveness means. Um, let's see. So um, Rebecca also writes, all expressions of wrath move us beyond being upset about an injustice and wanting to set it right to a desire to hurt someone, to make them pay, to inflict punishment on them, not as a good, but as an evil. So wrath would be um, not so much um, person A is hurting person B. How can we help person B to feel better and help person A to stop hurting person B? But wrath would be gonna punch person A. I'm just gonna punch him right in the stupid face. Um, don't don't punch people. It's it's don't don't punch people. Um, this a friend of mine uh, has several pets, and after acquiring a a dog, her, her cat kept punching the dog in the face. The cat was not thrilled about the, the intruder. Cats should be nice to dogs. Dogs are great. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't, don't, don't punch people. I shouldn't have to say that, but just, just don't. Um, yeah, so again, the, the differentiation between anger and wrath is really important when thinking of wrath as a sin. So, uh, Frederick Beekner, who I've brought up 
multiple times during this series uh, because he's he's very deeply quotable. He's a great writer. I totally recommend that you read uh, some of his stuff. Um, and um, Rebecca, the author of this book, agrees with me because she often uh, also cites him in uh, quite a few chapters. So um, Buechner wrote, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel, that's a great phrase, uh, the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Really great way with words Beekner has. Um, so it is very uh, satisfying to uh, share angry stories. Uh, I really enjoy um, reading stories about a uh, petty revenge. It's, it's very satisfying. Um, and it's a lot more engaging to um, tell a story to a friend and have them get angry on your behalf rather than, oh, I went to a store and the, the cashier was really nice. Cool story, bro. I mean, good for you, but that's not a very engaging anecdote. Uh, whereas if you have a whole thing about how the, the shopper behind you in line kept uh, running over your foot with their cart, um, people can be like, oh, that, that kind of person is the worst. How, how dare they? Did you tell them something? I don't know. That's going to be a livelier conversation. I think that definitely says something about uh, humankind and uh, what motivates us um, because we would rather engage in that kind of storytelling than the more mundane people are nice, let us encourage people to be nice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously there has to be a conflict in order for a plot to exist in a story. Um, you know, the, the bears had a, a lovely picnic and everyone was happy the end is terrible story. Um, so, let's see. I thought I should quote some Jesus in here. So from the, the Sermon of the Mount um, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, uh, scrolling down, uh, you, have heard it's that, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Side note, still holds, don't murder people, just, just don't do it. Just say no to murder. Uh, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the fire of hell. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. This is the word of the Lord. Um, so as I've said before, you know, it's one thing to just not murder people. It's kind of a, a low bar. Um, but not letting uh, disagreements fester and uh, not pretending that there aren't problems and not um, justifying to yourself, well, I mean, it's not like I got into a physical fight. I just like insulted the guy to his face. Um, that kind of thing is also a problem and Jesus is not thrilled with it, to put it mildly. Um, okay. So it, it kind of seems in inevitable when uh, talking about uh, righteous anger um, that Martin Luther King Jr. would uh, come in into the conversation um, and of course he said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Martin Luther King often gets quoted very out of context. Um, it, it can say a lot about a person of uh, what Martin Luther King quotes they, uh, they, they, they dig up or, or put on their, their social media, especially uh, in February, which can be very, very interesting. Um, and it would be easy to read this as kind of a, a hippie statement of all you need is love. And uh, now the Beatles song is going to be stuck in my head. Gosh darn it, that's going to be very annoying tonight. Uh, 
Sorry if I just did that to you too. It's a very catchy song. Um, but uh, righteous anger and the fight for social justice is a manifestation of love. Uh, because if you love someone, then you want them to, I don't know, not be hurting. <laughs> um, to live in a, a just society where there is mercy and kindness and fairness and, I don't know, no hunger. <laughs> Uh, no, no homelessness, what, what, what a concept, no massive social inequity and economic disparity and there are a lot of problems in the world that I could get extremely angry about. I can try to rein that in right now or this will go a while. Um, but anger can be driven by love uh, as long as it is trying to produce uh, a, a means to resolve the issue at hand. Whereas wrath just goes and shoots somebody, which again is, is never it's never the answer. Don't don't shoot people. Maybe with uh, squirt guns, I guess. But that's neither here nor there. So uh, some sins mostly hurt ourselves. Um, some sins hurt other people more than ourselves. Uh, I think wrath uh, hurts both us and other people for for sure definitely, for sure, hurt, hurt, hurts other people. So um, what specific immoral actions might be motivated by wrath and fall under this general uh, category of the seven deadly sins? Uh, so I guess like violence in general is a pretty obvious answer. Um, shouting matches, insulting people on the internet. Um, yeah. People, people are, are not always very nice on the internet. I almost always regret reading the comments section of, of any article or anything, really. Um, because on, on the internet you're not looking at somebody and it can be easier to forget that you're, you're talking to a person. I mean, I guess sometimes it's a bot, but I mean, they're... Anyway, uh, don't need to get into that. So, um... Why is wrath such a deadly sin? Is it really that bad? As long as we are talking about wrath and not anger, and again, it's very important to keep those two separate, yes, wrath is a deadly sin. It really is that bad. Um, I mean, the answer has always been, yes, it is a problem. Uh, if we're, we're talking about what the seven deadly sins are referring to and not what uh, it would be easier for us if they meant. So um, each of the seven deadly sins has its opposite in one of the seven virtues. So the opposite of wrath is patience or uh, forbearance or uh, self-control uh, or self-restraint, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. And um, I think that, um, I mean, not that there's an easy fix to, you know, deep-seated anger issues um, or tendencies towards violence, but taking a pause for a breath before responding is usually a good place to start, uh, especially if things are, are getting heated. Uh, and remember that you're having a conversation or a dialogue with someone rather than talking at them if you're uh, starting to feel very, um, things are bubbling up. Uh, yeah, so, you know, in, in conclusion, don't punch people, basically, is that's just gonna... That's gonna be my takeaway for you. Don't don't punch people. Yeah, that's wrath. <laughs> so um, yeah. So uh, wrath, ira is the, the final of our seven uh, deadly sins because I, I decided to alphabetize them because the world is very chaotic and something should be in order and so I alphabetized things because I can. Uh, so th this concludes our series. So um, as we continue through Holy Week, uh, tomorrow night we will have our Wednesday evening prayer uh, that I've put together. On uh, Thursday we have two events, as I mentioned yesterday. We will have uh, at 5 p.m. our Supper in the Upper Zoom. It's hilarious. Uh, so instead of having our usual um, casual hour of uh, fellowship time on Zoom, we'll have a slightly more structured conversation, uh, some time to pray together where we can hear each other's voices for a change, uh, rather than me talking into my camera and choosing to believe that you are adding your voices to mine at home, which I hope that you are doing, but I would have no way of knowing. 
Um, so then also on Thursday at uh, 7 p.m. we'll have a Monday Thursday evening service. On uh, Friday, we at, again at 7 p.m., we will have a, a Good Friday service. Um, we, uh, Doris and I recorded some uh, great music for that um, earlier in this week, so I'll be editing those videos later tonight because my life is video editing now. Yay. Um, on uh, Saturday at 8.30 p.m., when it is fully dark, we will have our Easter vigil. I finished writing that this morning at a late hour I won't divulge, um, and I think that it's coming together really well. We have some special readers for that and some really great music and some uh, wonderful stories from, from throughout scripture. And then of course on uh, Sunday, uh, Lent will finally end and the tomb will be empty and we will rejoice. Um, and so I invite you to join us at 10 on Sunday morning for our Easter service. And then, of course, our uh, coffee hour on Zoom afterwards. And uh, you should be wearing a cute little Easter outfit for the occasion. Even if we're, we're not meeting in person on Easter, you can, you can still stick a flower behind your ear or something. Put on a hat or uh, put a flowered collar on your cat. That's probably what I'll be doing. She doesn't know this yet. Um, she hasn't been wearing a collar recently because it made her very jingly outside the door when I was trying to live stream and the microphone didn't always pick it up and I found it distracting so she's just been running around uh, naked for, for several months now so that she can't jingle at me. Anyway, speaking of Ginger Snap, who will be wearing a flower collar this weekend, good night from us both and I hope to see you tomorrow night for our evening prayer.